that something truly amazing happened at the Second Vatican Council, which affected not only the Catholic Church, but the whole Christian world. Pope John XXIII, with extraordinary prophetic insight, realized that the progressive alienation of the Church from the modern world was a ruinous path that was blocking the fulfillment of Christ's commission to go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. The Church, he declared, had to change. The great... Uh, breakthrough of Vatican II, where uh, Pope John XXIII, uh, who in my estimation and that of many, many people, was a divinely inspired prophet for our time, who looked at the situation and said, if the church is going to do what Christ empowered it to do, which is preach the gospel to every creature, it has to do that not from a standpoint of animosity, condemnation, rejection, uh, elitism, superiority. It has to do that as part of that to which it was speaking. So it's like a human being discovering suddenly that they're a human <laughs> and beginning to talk as, as a human to humans instead of as a superior being to a lower form of life. So the, uh, the, uh, the especially Gaudium et Spes, the, the document on the Church of the Modern World, was about as completely different from the oath against modernism as one could imagine, where the Church is saying uh, Christians share with all people in the world the vocation to holiness that God has given to, to humanity, that everything human resonates in the heart of the Christian, that, um, that we wish to be in and with and for the world. The history of world rejection by the church was officially repudiated by the council. I think it is important to realize that this dramatic reversal was not simply a change of policy, some kind of marketing merger dictated by the church's falling sales volume in the religious marketplace. It was not even primarily a change in theological position. It was a gospel-inspired imaginative conversion, a new way of seeing, a reorientation of being, life, and action that had radical and profound implications for the church. And it was a conversion of the church, in which itself is amazing. For the church, instead of saying, you know, we are the spotless, you know, uh, institutional embodiment of all truth and everything God wanted to say to humanity, to, to say, uh, we've got lots of problems. We require real conversion to be able to hear what other people are saying, to see the wisdom in other traditions, to, uh, to accept our share of the burden of moving this world forward, of bringing about justice. Um, uh, it, so it, it really, it's almost the kind of conversion that, uh, that, I hate to use the word adolescence, but adolescents go through when they realize that the world is not entirely about them, <laughs> that they're part of the human race, they make mistakes like other people. When you make mistakes, you say, I'm sorry. Uh, when you talk to people, you listen to them, and so on. So the church is going through this, uh, I would say, it, it's not only not simply a marketing ploy that you know we're losing people to the Protestants, so we've got to change our advertising. Uh, and it's not even simply a theological uh, change of mind where we say, you, you know, we need to look at certain other documents or look at or doctrines differently, but it, it's a real conversion of the heart. The New Testament image of world is realistic, quite nuanced, and I think ultimately hopeful. But the polyvalence of the use of the term cosmos, world, forces us to raise the question, what does the term mean in the New Testament? How are Christians to participate in the world? And what challenges and opportunities does participation in the world offer to the church? The Greek term for world, cosmos, is very polyvalent especially the Gospel of John, that uh, we can say God so loved the world, meaning people, that God gave God's only Son, that people would not be condemned but would be saved, uh, that 
the whole universe is God's good creation from Genesis on that uh, God saw what God had made and said it's good, it's good, it's very good. Uh, so uh, you have very positive meanings. Uh, Jesus comes from God into the world so he doesn't come into hell, he comes into that which, which God made and intends for salvation. Uh, but you also have a very negative use of world uh, that equates world with the uh, with the reign of Satan. And not an awful lot of our Christian theology of the world has acted as if only that negative meaning was intended. So the idea was we were to be separated from the world, we were to flee the world, we were to die to the world. The world was... Uh, it was the source of sin, the source of temptation, and so on. In his final prayer at the Last Supper, Jesus is explicit that he does not pray that God take his disciples out of the world, but that God guard them from evil as they continue his work in the world. The world is humanity's natural home, our only context. We are not in exile here, yearning to escape imprisonment in history any more than we are spirits imprisoned in a material body. We are in this world, indeed part of this world, as Jesus was, by vocation, to participate in the cosmic process in the human enterprise. This world, the theater of human history, is good. For those of us who are Christians, uh, I think we can be tempted to very easily say, well, Christianity is one take on things, it's, it's we don't want to make any claims for it because, after all, there are other religions and so on. And I was trying to say Christianity has something to bring to the table of interreligious dialogue where we're all interested in the future of our world, the future of the human race, and so on. And we have something to bring. And one of the things that we have to bring, which comes directly from the fact that we believe that God actually became incarnate in Jesus Christ and lived a human life among us and died a human death and that we are that we are him in the world today is that uh, we don't attempt to exit from history or to exit from the material universe or to uh, we don't regard uh, reality the reality that we encounter as illusion as something that uh, that um, you know, we have to somehow get beyond, but that as Jesus engaged with, as was born in a real family and uh, lived a real human life and dealt with individual people and actual cures of real diseases and so on, that what he was really showing us was that the particularity in which we're involved, the relationships that we actually have, the profession that we actually engage in, the uh, the issues with which we really struggle, that this is where the gospel will transform.